Hello, my name is Anthony Price. I'm a geophysicist with Total ENP. I'd like to tell a little story today about subsort modeling in 3D, uh, involving an integration of seismic well, gravity data, and eventually valid data by drilling. So to go over a few points of what I'd like to cover today, firstly, for the non-specialists in this uh, realm, for people who don't know gravity and magnetics very well, I'd like to introduce the techniques firstly and also introduce the problem at hand. Uh, what was the exploration question? Because a well-posed question is required for a good answer. Of course, I'll go over the data that's used, talk about some depth filtering or depth-specific analysis of the data, talk about the methodology for integration of the different data types, more specifically the 3D gravity modeling that was involved, and then an extension of that work going through the velocity and density cube modeling. I'll finish with some scenario testing and then some conclusions. So to introduce the techniques, we use extensively gravity in this integration. And gravity, of course, uh, is measured by an accelerometer, most often modeled as a mass on a spring, as you see on the left. And we're often looking for sedimentary basins, which are less dense than the host uh, uh, basement rock, as you see in the diagram on the right. So we have less acceleration, less gravity for these sedimentary units. To give a bit more detail of the different densities that are involved for different lithologies, displayed a range here with averages shown on the red bars, with in general the sedimentary rocks being less dense and the crystalline or igneous rocks being more dense. And for those sedimentary rocks above the basement, uh, there is an interesting relationship between density and velocity which we use to integrate the seismic and the gravity techniques. This relationship is known as the Gardner's relation. Um, the image from his original paper appears here on this slide. It's important to remember that this relationship needs to be calibrated locally as it's mostly compaction driven and compaction rates of course vary from place to place. So that is the well part of the integration. Looking at the different sensitivities between the seismic technique on the left and the gravity technique on the right, the ideal situation for seismic imaging is flat line stratigraphy. So it has wonderful vertical resolution, but for gravity data almost the opposite is true where it has better lateral sensitivity. So seismic is more sensitive to flat line geometry, and the gravity technique is more sensitive to vertical geometry. And of course, the real world geology is somewhere in between. So it does make some sense to combine the two techniques to be more sensitive to a wider range of structure. For example, salt structures can have very steep sides, which are a challenging seismic imaging problem but gravity can help define those edges with more certainty when it's combined with the seismic technique. As an example, uh, Preto and others um, in 2000 uh, published a, a small article describing that nearly 60% of the reserves found in the US side of the Gulf of Mexico were found on the flank of basement highs as the basement forms the main controlling structural trap for a lot of these reserves. And of course, gravity is rather good at mapping these kind of sedimentary basins and basement highs. So to give an overview of common applications of the gravity technique, it's most often used for looking at the tectonic structure, which gives a window on the structural history of a basin. It can be used to differentiate between different types of crust, continental or oceanic, and detail those crustal boundaries. It can be used for large-scale mapping, of uh, basins and their structural settings. It can outline geological provinces, salt provinces, volcanic provinces, uh, rusted terrains. But here we're going to be using it to look at basement structure. But it also has application in optimizing other geophysical acquisitions like seismic. So to move on to the problem at hand, the geological question here really is what's going on beneath the salt? It's a bit hard to see on this image, but there is some clear salt diapyric structures, complicated by rafted carbonates um, above them. Now in the seismic imaging problem, both the salt and the carbonates are fast, which makes them difficult to differentiate. But when we involve the gravity data in the inter integration, carbonates are dense and salt is not dense, so we have a chance at differentiating or discriminating between those two structures. But the exploration question here is what's going on underneath the salt? Because of the complex geometry and fast velocity of the carbonate platforms and the salt structures, imaging below the base of salt, in particular the area that's circled in red, is suboptimal. 
So we have to do a bit more work, even if we do identify a closure at base salt, as to what the structure is below. This is a small uh, example of one of those base salt closures, shown as the red structure in the top right hand side of each of the top two maps, and a regional 2D section on the red line shown below. So we can see that there's a closure at base salt um, that could possibly be uh, perspective. But there is great uncertainty in this interpretation due to the uncertainty in which is salt and which is carbonate and the velocities that are involved. So we start looking at other data. There's the bathymetry acquired with uh, high resolution 3D seismic. Uh, and those structures that were seen in the basalt closures are circled here in red. And there's a north target and a southern target. But we only have really good imaging down to that base salt, so we're quite interested in what's going on underneath. So early on in this process, it was noticed that at least the north closure corresponded uh, with a gravity high, uh, which is quite interesting. Um, this map shows a merge of the high resolution gravity data that was acquired with the 3D seismic acquisition, merged with regional data for continuity and uh, a reduction of edge effects. So you can faintly see the north structure and south structure circled there, which do correspond nicely to gravity closures. So the question was, of course, asked, is there an association between the basalt closures we see in the seismic and the gravity data we see here highlighting apparently similar structures? If we take those data and do an enhancement known as the first vertical derivative, those structures become more apparent. But it's also important to remember that Gravity data represents an integration of all structures to the surface. So this map is a sum, if you like, of subsalt structure and supersalt structure. So we notice a nice and uh, rather comforting correlation, but we need to do a bit more work in untangling the problem. Looking at the association between that map of the first vertical derivative of gravity and the contours based on the base salt closures, we see a bit more of a complex relationship when we start looking a bit more closely. So the first vertical derivative here is indicative of structure, but that's not the whole story. So what can we do to un untangle this complex uh, story between the rafted carbonates, which are dense, the salt, which is not dense, and what's going on underneath the salt, which is what we're really interested in? Well, happily, we have a fair amount of information in the 3D seismic velocity cube, perhaps with greater uncertainty subsalt, but above the salt, quite detailed picking and information. We can take that velocity cube in 3D and convert it to density via the Gardner's relationship we saw earlier. And of course, we've calibrated that relationship with nearby well data that records both the velocity and the density. That graph in the center top there represents the cloud of points from those wells that enabled us to do a best fit curve through there to give the um, calibrated coefficients for Gardner's relationship. And of course, we use that to turn the velocity cube on the top left into a density cube on the top right. Now, you might have remembered from the Gardner's relationship that salt is not part of that relationship because salt is incompressible. It's not subject to the compaction rules of the rest of the sediment. So we need to affix a constant density to that salt, but keep the Gardner's converted velocity into density for the rest of the sediments down to base salt. That detail appears in the bottom left, where you can see the light blue is the constant density salt. There are actually two layers, there's an autochthonous and a lochthonous salt layer, with carbonates in between, and then the subsalt structure, which is what we're interested in. Once we have a 3D detailed density model that's derived from the velocities calibrated with the well density, uh, well data and interdensity, we can calculate the gravity response of that model and compare it with the real measured data. And one of those maps appears on the right, the bottom side. A bit more of a detailed look at that 3D gravity model. This display is a little bit busy, but on the left-hand side, we have three map displays uh, of the area. There are five profiles running southwest to northeast through our area of interest, and those five profiles appear in depth in the central panels. And profiles for the calculated gravity from this model and the observed gravity appear in the right-hand side panels. Happily for the panels second and third from top, they pass through our two main structures of interest, the north structure and the south structure. And you can see there we have actually a basement high or increased density to help match the observed gravity that we see there. And we can do a lot of things with this kind of model. We can use it to 
um, analyze the differences between uh, different scenarios, do testing, but also do what's called backstripping. That is, remove all of the gravity signal that we have in our model down to base salt. And if we do that, we end up with a map that looks like this. Again, the north and south structures are fairly apparent in our area of interest uh, towards the left-hand side, and they remain there. So this map represents everything that we think is going on subsalt, with all that we know what's going on above the salt removed. And this kind of modeling and mapping gave more confidence to our interpretation of the subsalt structure that there is indeed a structural closure at these locations. We can do a bit more with that model than just backstrip as well. We can do inversion. If we think that there is a basement surface involved in these structural closures, we can invert for that basement surface using this model and go a bit further in quantifying how big, how deep this structure might be to satisfy all the observed data that we have. If we do that basement inversion, we end up with a surface that looks a bit like this. Again, there is still a structure in the north and the southern areas where we see closures in the base salt with the northern structure being apparently bigger than the southern structure, which is of interest for later. So all that's fine and good if we assume that our velocity model is correct. Unfortunately, in depth migration of 3D seismic in complex areas, there is often a number of velocity models that are generated, and it's rather difficult at times to know which one is correct. So we can revisit our workflow from before that we used to access what was going on below the salt, to actually try the same thing again with a number of different velocity models. So we take that velocity model, that velocity cube in 3D in the top left, convert it using the calibrated Gardner's relationship we see in the center top, to a density cube in the top right, uh, assign densities as we did before, and calculate the forward response of that model, and compare it with the observed data to see how good that model is with respect to what we observe bit more of a detailed look at that model and examining the differences between the calculated and the observed data for just one of those density velocity cubes. Um, again, there are map displays on the left with our five profiles through our area of interest displayed in depth in the central panels and the calculated and observed gravity data on the right hand side. These sections in the middle are a little bit different this time and shown in density and you can just make out perhaps the autochthonous and allochthonous salt layers that are at fixed density in the model. So if we start taking a detailed look at various velocity cubes used for depth imaging and their differences between the calculated and the observed gravity data in our area, we end up with focused maps on our area of interest that look a bit like the map on the left here with the associated model on the right. Of course, if we have differences between our calculated and gravity data, we can do some more quantitative analysis of the differences. In particular here, we started looking at the standard, dif uh, standard deviation differences. And for this particular update 5, it was called, velocity model, we have a standard error difference of about 0.93. Update 5, um, as we'll see later, was one of the more confident or more detailed velocity picking um, velocity cubes used for depth imaging. But there was also a question about whether that was the correct model or whether we could do better, and how we would choose, uh, based on more than just imaging conditions, which velocity model was best. So if we move to this particular update 5 that had a manual adjustment on the velocity picks uh, above the salt, we see that the standard error changes slightly. So the 3D gravity modeling seems to be somewhat sensitive to very detailed and subtle changes in the velocity model. And that gave us hope that we might be able to use the gravity modeling here to quantitatively choose the best velocity model for depth migration. Moving on to a second manual update, we see that the standard deviation changes once more. And for a sixth update, the standard difference changes again and actually worsens, which is interesting. If we look at a, a summary of some of those differences from update five that we started with up to update six, we can see the standard difference changing uh, significantly from one to the other. And one of those, of course, produced what was thought to be better subsalt imaging as well, which correlated very nicely with a minimization of that standard error. So as an example of some of the improvements we saw uh, looking at the different velocity uh, models used for depth migration, uh, this is a section through our area of interest with uh, the discernible base salt closure on more the left-hand side. 
After several updates of the velocity model and comparison with the calculated and observed gravity data, we ended up with our fifth manual update with improved imaging. And I'll flip back and forth a few times so that you can see indeed there is more coherency on the base of salt reflector, a better definition in our base of salt closure area, which is circled in red, and also in subsalt reflections, which are our target of interest. So to summarize the series of modeling and examination of velocity cubes in comparison to gravity data, uh, a table appears here with our manual update 5 pointed out as well, which was seen as one of the best results with the best subsalt imaging. But there are also some other interesting factors where uh, an earlier update also produced a minimization in the gravity error uh, with the suggestion that we revisit those results for what might have been the reason for them. We also tried some end-member testing, uh, looking at crash cases, extreme interpretations to reassure ourselves and build confidence that our solutions were unique and uh, there were not others that were equally possible. And we also had a look at changing some of the subsalt velocities which seemed to have actually little impact on the final result. So to conclude, uh, we feel that we demonstrated quite clearly that the gravity modeling supports the existence of subsalt structure as we've seen in the seismic giving greater confidence to our subsalt uh, interpretation in areas where the seismic imaging is not optimal. And we agreed at least with the seismic interpretation that we saw subsalt structure in the form of elevated density, um, most probably basement uh, involved structures. We went a bit further looking at a variety of velocity cube to density conversions to demonstrate that there is indeed a correlation between improved fit with the observed gravity data and improved subsalt imaging with the velocity associated velocity cubes. Happily, we got to find out if we were right in that the northern closure in this particular instance was drilled and encountered sands with gas condensate validating our interpretation. And due to that success, uh, new acquisition of seismic, gravity and magnetic data have been uh, performed and are being assessed to illuminate other interesting structure and prospectivity in the area. And as a future view, uh, joint inversion, a more quantitative approach to combining these data, is uh, being examined quite closely, with one example being long wavelength density variation for full waveform seismic inversion. And with that, I'd like to acknowledge uh, our partners and Total for support and permission to publish, and my co-authors who contributed greatly to this work.